Well, good morning, First Baptist Paducah. I'm so glad to see you today. Turn with me in your copy of God's Holy Word to Luke chapter 15, if you would. I have to say a word about Russ Wilson. He has done such a good job. Doesn't he lead us into worship every week? Just fantastic. Fantastic. Praise, praise the Lord. Thank you, dear brother. Russ, look around at the people standing up, clapping for you. Thank you. Well, Luke 15 is one of the great chapters in God's holy word. I preached a series one time on the 10 greatest chapters of the New Testament. It'd be hard to choose, wouldn't it? But uh, how would you choose? One of them would certainly be John 3. One of them probably Matthew 16. Romans 8. Revelation 21. But for me, one of the greatest chapters of God's holy word is Luke 15. In it, Jesus tells three wonderful parables that we're going to get into in just a moment. And Would you stand with me for the reading of the holy word of God? Now the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Hmm. And he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he had a hundred sheep and lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found the sheep which was lost. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Then he goes on with a second parable. Or what woman, if she has 10 coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the inheritance that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. <clears throat> Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, don't you know that dad was looking? His father saw him and he felt compassion for him and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and be married. 
For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the joy there is in heaven when any of us repent and turn to you. So let there be joy in heaven this very day, Lord, from this very sanctuary over some turning to you. But all around the world today, this your Lord's day, let there be tens of thousands that come to know you as Lord and Savior and bring great joy in your sight. And help us, Lord, be joyful Christians that you can count on to have your heart for leading the lost to Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Frank Pollard tells a story of a little boy who was always forgetting things. And his parents convinced him, you're going to have to keep a list of where everything is. And so one night before he went to bed, he made his list. My shirt is in the closet. My pants are in the closet. My belt is in the closet. My underwear and undershirt are on top of the dresser. My shoes are under the dresser and the socks are in them. My toothbrush and toothpaste are in the bathroom. And I am in the bed. The next day he got up, he found his toothbrush, he found his toothpaste, he he, he got, had everything that he needed. He put his clothes on and he checked each one off the list until he got to himself and he looked in his bed and he couldn't find himself. He had lost himself. Well, you realize that story's not so, but you also know a lot of people who have lost themselves, do you not? And all of us in life, if we're not careful, can lose ourselves. Jesus told three parables here of people who were lost for different reasons and how there was great rejoicing in heaven when they were found. Now, if you're outlining this, the first part of the outline is the concern of the Lord. The cause of the Lord. What was his cause? What was his concern? It was that the lost be found. You remember this chapter starts with the tax gatherers and sinners coming to Jesus, but it made the Pharisees and scribes grumble. <coughs> they didn't want the sinners coming to Jesus. And by the way, who is a sinner? A sinner is somebody who's not like us, right? And they didn't want them coming to Jesus. So Jesus told them a parable about what his purpose in life was. How do you know that you're like Jesus if you're the shepherd seeking the one that's lost? You're like Jesus. If you're the woman who's searching for the lost coin, you're like Jesus. And by the way, there are a number of places in the Bible where God is referred to in the masculine. Here, Jesus refers to God in the feminine. He's like a woman who lost ten coins. But there was great rejoicing when she found those coins. If you're like the father who's longing for that lost child to come back home, you're like Jesus, the cause of the Lord. There's a Jewish scholar named Mont, Claude Montfiore. Montfiore never came to Christ, to my knowledge. But he studied world religions, and he said, here is the, one of the greatest things about Christianity. It pictures God as seeking the lost. In every other religion, it's man seeking, how can I find God? But in Christianity, it's God seeking man. Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, called him the hound of heaven who runs after us and seeks us. Haven't you found it so? When you've turned a little away from the Lord that here's the hound of heaven nipping at your conscience, 
wanting to pull you back in. The cause of the Lord is the concern for the lost. But secondly, I want us to camp down on this second point today. And the second point is the condition of the lost because people are lost for different reasons. And Jesus tells three parables here that tell why people are lost. The first one, the sheep was lost due to wandering. Now the Bible compares us to sheep. God doesn't do us any favor when he compares us to sheep. Have you ever seen sheep on a hillside? They're just wandering everywhere. And the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him, that is on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. We're sheep. The sheep didn't mean to go astray. It just kind of wandered. Didn't mean to. But I'm told that sheep only have eyesight for 10 or 15 feet. And they'll keep their head down eating grass. And a bear or a wolf can come up on them and can get five or six steps from them before they even know it's there. He didn't mean to go astray. He just kind of was doing his own thing, eating this bit of grass and 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 this one over here and this one over here. And after a while, all the other sheep were a long way off and he was lost. But the shepherd goes back after him and finds him. And it's so easy for people to be lost that way. They don't mean to be, but they just kind of wander off. You know, they, they go to the prom and someone offers a... Have you tried this? Have you tried this drug? And if given the choice in front of their parents, they'd say, well, I'm not going to do that. But with all of their friends around, what will it hurt just to try it one time? And one time is all it takes to get addicted hmm. for some of these strong drugs today. Didn't mean to go astray, but just kind of wandered off wandered off. When I was in college, I was in ROTC, and I took um, orienteering. Have any of you had orienteering? It's where you, you, uh, you take your compass, and you, you, uh, you set a, a compass point out somewhere. The compass follows the magnetic north, but maybe you want to go southwest a certain number of degrees, and so you set your compass just right, and then you look down it, and you find a tree that's a thousand yards out that's right on your compass point. And so you walk directly to the tree and then you set it again to the next point and so that way you can stay exactly on where your compass says to go. But one thing I found out in orienteering, if you're five feet off of a hundred, when you get to a thousand feet, you're 50 feet off. And then when you get to half a mile, you're so far away you can't even see where you're supposed to be. The Bible talks about the straight and narrow road. And it's so easy, not to mean to, but just to kind of wander away. That's why the hymnist said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And yet God in his great mercy comes with his open arms and pulls us back to himself. What a loving God we have. And there's a great rejoicing when someone who's wandered away comes back because the shepherd goes to get the sheep, puts him on his shoulder, and when he gets back, he brings his friends all in and they rejoice together. Parable number one, the Lostness due to wandering. Parable number two, the coin that was lost was lost due to carelessness. Now to understand this parable, there's a couple of things we need to understand. Here's the basic parable. The lady had ten coins. She lost one. She couldn't find it. And then she, when she finally does find it, she calls in her friends to rejoice. Now, this is kind of a strange parable to us because... We wouldn't, I mean, if you lose a coin, I mean, some of you would not even stop to pick up a penny. I still do, okay? But um, 
you know, why would you, why would you call friends together to rejoice over a coin that was found? Here's the reason. In the day that Jesus lived, most people were very poor. 99% of the people were very poor. And the ladies did not receive a share of the inheritance when uh, parents died. The men received the inheritance. If there were two men, the older one got two-thirds of the inheritance and the younger one one-third. And that was so because the older one was supposed to take care of the parents while they were living, sort of their Social Security. <laughs> but uh, the ladies didn't get anything. However, when the ladies got married, they received a dowry. And their dowry, if poor, poor population, poor folks, generally was 10 coins if the family could afford it. 10 drachmas is the name of the coin here. It's a Roman silver coin. And a drachma is about one day's wage for a working person. That's a very low wage. But it was so low because there were so many slaves back in that day that it undercut the salaries for, the, for most of the population. And so if a, if a lady had 10 coins she received in her dowry, she would wear it on a headdress or on a necklace, punching holes through the coins and keeping those coins. Now, to us, it's just 10 coins, but to them, to the lady, that was the difference between her family being in abject poverty or having enough to eat if things came down to it. She could always take one of those coins and buy enough to feed her family that night and have enough left over for breakfast. So 10 coins were very important to them. The houses in that day were small, much smaller than this, this podium area. And generally, if just four walls and a, and a little ledge was out, no windows, but a little ledge on which you would set a, 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 a lamp, an earthenware lamp, olive oil, wick on it. And it gave off very little light. So the floor... In most of the homes was were dirt was dirt, but in some of the homes it was uh, basalt. Basalt is a rock formed from uh, volcanic action, and so we know there were a lot of basalt mines in the uh, Middle East. There was one discovered near Capernaum, and they would cut this basalt in in layers, a very brittle rock, so it couldn't be very long because it would break under itself. But they would take it and use it like tile in the floor. And when the lady's coins broke and fell in the floor, she found nine of them, but she couldn't find the other. Why? Because that silver coin over the days would turn dark and it would look like that basalt floor or would get lost in the seams of the floor. So she brought another lamp in and lighted it up and searched and searched and searched and finally she found it. And when she did, she brought her friends in and they all rejoiced. Why? Because they were in the same boat she was. They knew what it was to lose a coin and then find it. And so there was great rejoicing. Jesus said, if a lady would do that and rejoice over a coin that's lost and found, shouldn't God rejoice over one sinner that turns to me? And so there's great rejoicing in heaven. This case was lost due to carelessness because, you see, the cords that held the coins would eventually wear out and ladies would have to be very diligent to keep a strong cord in there. Apparently, this cord wore out and the coins dropped. Lost due to carelessness. Yesterday, I was filling my car with gas. Anybody got a loan? I was filling my car with gas and the lady in the car next to me began yelling at her granddaughter sitting on the front seat. The granddaughter just held her head. She said something or another about my sissy granddaughter that can't stop crying. Folks, if you're an authority over a child, don't ever treat them that way. And I began thinking, what would it be like to grow up in that lady's home or in her environment? 
How sad, how sad. Nobody should have to grow up like that. Children need love, and they should grow up with love and affection and genuine care. But that little child may have been lost due to carelessness, not of her own fault, but the fault of the grandma. Hmm. And I think about parents today that fail to bring their kids to church. We make sure they're in school. They go to dance lessons, piano lessons. They go to soccer practice. They go to football practice and basketball practice, even basketball camps. Coach Cal's camps in June, by the way. They go to all of these things. And parents pay good money for it. And wonderfully so. Maybe we ought to start charging for Sunday school, you know? We've got to bring up our kids in the fear and nurture of the Lord. There's nothing more important than to raise our children knowing Jesus, knowing about him, knowing of him, loving him, living for him. Some are lost due to wandering. You can make a point that it might be the sheep's fault. It wasn't a coin's fault. It was the fault of others. Some are lost due to carelessness. But then there's a third parable Jesus tells. And it's the parable of the lost boy. There's the lost uh, sheep, there's the lost coin, and then there's the lost boy or young man. And he was a pitiful fellow, so to speak. He grew up on a farm. Any of you grow up on a farm? It's not easy work, is it? Or my, my, I didn't, but my parents did. And um, wow, it's tough work. I've heard folks that grew up on a farm say, I'll never go back to the farm again. That was this boy. He was tired of that farm work. And he said to his daddy, give me my share of the estate now. Well, you know, that was tantamount to saying to your father, I wish you were dead. Because my possession means more to me than you do. I wonder how many times he begged his father for his share of the estate. But finally, the father gave in and split the estate between the older son and the younger one. The younger one soon sold off his share of the farm, sold off all of his animals, took the money, went to a far country. And there he raised Cain. He learned how to raise Cain, apparently, as a farmer. He, uh, he raised habit. He lost his estate due to loose living, the Bible says. But the father never quit looking. I wonder how many times. The Bible says when he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming. <laughs> I wonder how many times the father was plowing along the way and the row went like this because he looked up to look down the road to see, is my boy coming today? Is today the day he'll come back home? And he looked and looked. And one day there he was. The Bible says he saw him far off. The greatest sermon I ever heard on the prodigal son came from a Scottish preacher. You want to hear the outline, just the outline of it. You know, Scottish preachers call boys or young men lads. And he said this was a mad lad because he was mad for growing up on the farm, having to do the farm work. Then he was a bad lad because he said to his father, give me my share of the estate. He, the estate meant more than his dad did. Then he was a fad lad because he took his money and he spent it on the fads of the day. And they change day after day, don't they? Year after year. And then he was a had lad because when he had his money, he had plenty of friends, but when his money gave out, where were his friends? Huh. He was a had lad. Famine came in the land. And then he was a sad lad because the only job he could get was a job tending to pigs. 
That was the lowest job a Jewish child could have because pork was a, a, an animal that was unclean. Archaeologists, when they uncover a village and they don't know if it's a Jewish or a Gentile village, if they find pig bones there, they know it's a Gentile village. That's the way they know. Pork is unclean for Jewish people. But he had to take care of the, of the pigs. And not only that, there wasn't even enough food for him to eat. The pigs were eating, according to the scripture, pods. That would be pods of the carob tree, long beans that they would pick off the trees. And the carob tree, uh, bean tastes a little like chocolate. It's not very nourishing, but it will get a person through to the next day if they have to. One Jewish uh, commentator said, when times get so tough that the people have to eat the carob beans, then they start calling on God. Well, this, this young man was feeding the pigs, and he finally came to his senses. You know, even my daddy's servants have it better than this. I'm here with no shoes. I can't eat. I feed the pigs. This is terrible. I, I think I'll just go home and ask Dad if I can work on the farm again, except this time I won't ask him to be a son. I'll just ask him to be one of his hired men. So he came to himself and he went home. And so finally he was a glad lad because when he started home and got within sight, his father was already looking. As I see the dad... I see this picture of Jesus with his arms open wide. His father ran to the boy, and he hugged him. Now think of it. This boy had been with the pigs. He smelled like pigs. Any of you ever been around a pig pen? And he, uh, he probably looked like the pigs. When he started talking, he probably oink, oinked like the pigs, you know? But it didn't matter. His boy had come back home. And he hugged him and began to kiss his neck, which was common for that culture. He was so glad he was back again. Some of you have had an experience where you've had a child that's gone astray, and you know the joy that it is when they come back home. And Jesus said, there's great rejoicing in heaven when his lost ones come back again. That's what happened. This boy came back home. His dad hugged him, and he started this spill. Father, no longer call me your son, but before he could even say, make me one of the hired servants, the father said, quick, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the shoes. The old spiritual, I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. It comes from this parable. He didn't have any shoes. He had lost everything he had, but now he had shoes. When I get to heaven, going to run on, walk in my shoes, going to run all over God's heaven. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> it was going to be fun. He was going to have the stuff there. He was God's child then. John Drakeford was a, a professor of counseling at Southwestern Seminary. And he used to pastor in Australia. And he tells a story of visiting one of his members who, who um, had a parent in the, in the home. The, the father, according to Drakeford, was stupid. Now, I didn't say that, but that's what Drake, Drakeford said. He said that he had an, uh, an opinion about everything, and it was usually a negative opinion. And he was not reticent to share it at any time. And one day his boy disagreed with him and he said to his son, well, if you don't see things the way I see it, this is my home, you can just leave. And so the boy did. He left. He packed up his bag and he left. And they never saw him again. At that time, older teenagers could join the military in Australia and about that time, there was a war going on. Australian troops were called to Crete and to Cyprus. And many of those young recruits were mowed down there. And they believed, but they don't know, 
that their boy was buried under an olive tree somewhere in Cyprus or in Crete. But Drakeford said they had a, a certain ritual every night. The mother said this ritual started when our kids were teenagers and they would go out on a date. At nighttime, we'd always turn the light on on the porch and put the key under the mat. And so ever since the boy left, they still turned on the light and put the key under the mat so that if he ever did decide to come back, he would know you're welcome home. The father who received his child back began to rejoice and make merry. Kill the fatted calf. I wonder how many calves they had fattened so that just in case the boy came back, they'd be ready to have a party. You know the reason I'm saying this today, don't you? Some, somebody here, maybe in this sanctuary, is a prodigal who's gone astray. It's time to come home. Your father has his arms open wide. Won't you come to him today? He would love to rejoice with you. Won't you come to him today? Some of you don't have a church home. This is a wonderful church. Won't you come join us today? We're going to stand and have our hymn of invitation. And as we do, the invitation is open, and it's open for you. Your father is saying, come home. Give us some rejoicing in heaven. Come today while we stand and sing.